This is Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com, and in this video, I'm going to be going over Guillain Barre syndrome. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over the neuro system. And as always, at the end of this YouTube video, you can access the free quiz that will test you on this condition. So let's get started. Guillain Barre syndrome, also called GBS, is an autoimmune condition where the immune system actually attacks the nerves in the body. Now, what nerves are we talking about? We are talking about the peripheral nerves, so those nerves in the peripheral nervous system, and the cranial nerves. So let's talk a little bit about the peripheral nervous system. Okay, where are those nerves located? They are located outside of the brain and the spinal cord. So that's what makes GBS different than let's say multiple sclerosis. Those nerves being affected were in the central nervous system, so in the brain and the spinal cord. But we're talking about the peripheral nervous system here. So just remember that. Now, our peripheral nervous system can be divided into two parts. We have the somatic, which controls your voluntary functions, and then we have the autonomic, which controls our involuntary functions. Now, if GBS is severe enough, it can actually extend into the autonomic nervous system. And whenever we go a little bit over the path, though, and what's going on in the body, you will see what is happening with autonomic dysfunction. Now, what is happening in Guillain-Barre syndrome? Well, we learned the immune system is attacking the nerve cell. But what part of the nerve cell is being attacked? The myelin sheath. What's happening is demyelinization is occurring. And in order for that nerve to work correctly, the myelin sheath has to be there to do its job. So let's talk a little bit about nerve cell anatomy and physiology. So what's the whole purpose of a nerve? It receives and transmits signals so some type of action can occur. For instance, you have all these nerves in your legs and your feet, so you can feel sensations, so you can move them. You have nerves going to those muscles on your chest, so you can breathe in and breathe out. But if they're not working, you're not going to feel sensation. You're not going to be able to breathe very well. You can go into respiratory failure, which is one of the big things I want you to take away with Guillain-Barre syndrome. Respiratory failure can occur as this disease progresses. So the nerve receives some type of signal at the dendri dendrites. It transfers first that down to the soma of the nerve, the body, then that signal goes down through the axon. And notice the area on the axon, it has these blue areas. That's the myelin sheath. And the myelin sheath insulate that axon so that signal can easily just go down through there and not be interrupted. And then that signal goes out through the axon terminal and our action happens whatever that nerve supplies. But what's happening is that the immune system is attacking that. Now, why is it actually attacking it? Well, a lot of times with patients who have GBS, they've suffered some type of illness. So that's why as the nurse, you wanna ask your patient an extensive medical history. Ask what's been going on with you since you're all of a sudden presenting with these signs and symptoms. Because GBS can affect anyone of any age any gender, race, anything like that. Everyone is at a possible risk for developing this. So remember that. And there's also no cure for this condition, but there are some treatments that we're gonna talk about a little bit later that can help improve and increase recovery. So you've had this patient who's had some type of illness and the immune system was fighting that illness, but somewhere along the way it got confused and it started to attack these myelin sheath. And then you start having all these problems. Now again, Guillain-Barre syndrome can also be called GBS. And to help me remember it, I remember that there's gradual block of sensation going on. And there's various types of Guillain-Barre syndrome. The most common type here in the US is acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. Say that 10 times fast. But with that type, it tends to start in the feet. So the patient will have this weird sensation in their feet, paresthesia, like tingling, numbness, and then um, it'll migrate upwards. It ascends and it's symmetrical. So it starts ascending up this body all the way to the head until the patient is paralyzed. 
So that's one thing you want to remember about this. You can also have different types like Miller Fisher syndrome and that's where the paralysis starts in the eyes but we're really going to concentrate on the other type so whenever that happens myelin sheath of course is being attacked you're not going to get this signal eventually the nerves are just going to quit working and the patient's going to have a lot of issues so again let's talk about the why okay we talked about the immune system attacking the myelin sheath because of a recent illness so a lot of times you'll have patients who have normally been healthy but they may report to you yeah about one to two weeks ago i had this severe upper respiratory infection or I had a gastrointestinal infection caused by Campylobacter jejuni. And an interesting statistic by CDC.gov states this, as many as 40% of GBS cases in the United States are thought to be triggered by the Campylobacter infection. So that is pretty staggering. So always ask your patients what's been going on with you, what are your signs and symptoms prior to these signs and symptoms that you're presenting here with today. It's also been linked with patients who've had the Epstein-Barr infection, along with HIV, AIDS, and some cases have developed due to a recent vaccine they received, like the swine flu, influenza and things like that. Now let's talk about how GBS is diagnosed because as a nurse you want to be familiar with the type of test that can be used to assess for this condition. One test is called an electromyography and nerve conduction studies and what this does is it assesses for demyelinization of the nerves by determining the muscle's ability to respond to nerve stimulation and here on the left you can see a picture of that test being done also one test i really want you to remember is a lumbar puncture now what this is, just like the name says, they will puncture the lumbar area and they will drain off cerebral spinal fluid. And they're looking for something. They're looking for elevated protein without elevated white blood cells. That will be a positive result that will test positive for Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now, some things I wanna go over with you quickly about your role with the lumbar puncture. Before, you wanna make sure the patient empties their bladder. Why is that? so there isn't a risk of the bladder being punctured during the procedure. And then during, if you have to assist with this, um, they will most likely be positioned in the lateral recumbent position with knees up to the abdomen and bending the chin to the chest. Now afterwards, post-op after this, you'll wanna keep the patient flat. This will help decrease a headache and keep them flat for however much time the physician has prescribed and they'll need to consume fluids to help replace that fluid that was lost during uh, the lumbar puncture. So that'll help decrease a headache too. So you'll wanna encourage your patient to consume that. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology along with the signs and symptoms and the nursing interventions because patho lets us know the sign and the symptom. The sign and the symptom lets us know the nursing intervention and why we're doing these certain things. So let's blend the two. So hopefully it'll make sense in your mind and you won't have to just memorize a bunch of information. Okay, so let's talk about the scenario. We have this patient in their 30s, relatively healthy, has like no health history, but they've came to you because in their lower extremities, specifically their feet, in both of them, they've noticed that they're having numbness and tingling and it's got so bad that they're having issues walking and they say they haven't injured them or anything like that. But the one thing that stands out to you as you're getting their medical history is that they report about two weeks ago having a severe GI illness. So all those bells are going off. Oh no, you know, this is in the lower extremities. They just had an infection about two weeks ago. Could this be the beginning of Guillain-Barre syndrome? Okay. So first sign and symptom, we have paresthesia, typically gonna be in that lower extremities, those feet. And as time goes on, it's going to migrate symmetrically, it's gonna ascend upward. And why is that happening? Because those peripheral nerves that are assigned to those areas down there are not working. They're experiencing demyelinization of that myelin sheath. So that 
transfer of that signal is not going so a person can't really feel it and it's going to get so severe that they're going to get paralysis so they're going to lose reflexes they're not going to have that they're going to lose like their muscle tone they can't control their muscles so as it goes up they can become paralyzed from the waist down so here you have this healthy person all of a sudden is paralyzed from the waist down very scary for them for everyone involved then as it progresses because in two weeks GBS tends to hit its peak that's when the worst signs and symptoms happen and then after that remyelinization starts to occur so the patient starts to slowly get better and these symptoms start subsiding but it takes about one to two years for that patient to get back to their baseline just because of all really the damage that's done from being paralyzed from sometimes the neck down and as you'll hear in a moment you're going to see why that road to recovery is going to be so long so it migrates up hands affected arms affected can't move those don't have reflexes can affect our muscles that allow us and help us to pull that in air in and out so you got to watch for your patient saying, you know, it's just getting really hard to breathe. It feels like I can't take a deep breath in. I can't breathe in. They're, they have a weak, ineffective cough. You're having to go in their room and suction them because those sats are dropping and they're not doing good. So as a nurse, intervention-wise, you want to make sure you have airway management at the bedside, that suction set up, anything that you're going to need for this patient because respiratory issues is what we're really watching out for with these patients. Then it can migrate up all the way up into the brain until it starts hitting the cranial nerves. And the cranial nerves, whenever that starts to become affected, they can have paralysis of their face, can't move their face at all. So you gotta watch with the eyes, ointment drops for the eyes to keep that moist they can also have issues swallowing so they're at risk for aspiration if they aspirate what can happen they can develop pneumonia so make sure you're assessing their swallowing abilities and they can have issues speaking communicating with you they can't articulate it so the patient knows what's going on they're very fearful they're very scared they don't really know what's going on so it's very important you know how to communicate with them like a whiteboard or something like that and reassure remind the patient that this is probably temporary you're going to hopefully be recovering and being able to get sensation back. They can also have vision issues as well. Now, as I said at the beginning of the lecture, if this is a severe case of Guillain-Barre syndrome, that autonomic nervous system can be affected, which is our parasympathetic and sympathetic system, which is our fight or flight system. So as a nurse, you really have to watch out for those signs and symptoms associated with that because medications and Stuff like that will need to be ordered to help combat that. So watching that blood pressure, that heart rate, looking for any type of dysrhythmias like bradycardia, tachycardia, anything like that. Also orthostatic hypotension or parasismal hypertension. And you'll wanna be looking at their temperature because they will lose the inability to regulate their temperature and GI system can be involved as well. You wanna watch out for constipation because there's a decrease in gastric motility. Those nerves that are feeding your intestines aren't really gonna be working very well, so the motility is going to decrease. So a lot of times patients have feeding tubes to help maintain that nutrition because they have the issue swallowing. It's not safe for them to swallow, so they'll have feeding tubes. So you'll always want to make sure you're listening for those bowel sounds because paralytic ileus can sometimes occur because they're immobile and that can increase the risk for that. And you'll want to check those gastric residuals prior to starting new feedings because the food just isn't going through those intestines as fast as it should and you'll want to make sure that the residuals aren't too high. Renal system can be affected as well. That sphincter that controls the 
flow of urine can not work and the patient can start to retain urine. So bladder scanning that bladder, how much urine's in there? How much urine are they putting out? Their I's and O's. And they may need an in and out cath or they may need a catheter. In addition, the patient can experience pain, which is sort of a paradox, isn't it? Because they are having paralysis down through their body where these nerves aren't working. So you would think that they wouldn't have pain, but a lot of patients report severe pain, specifically in the muscles, like cramping of the muscles where those peripheral nerves are damaged. So communication again is even more important because you want to help the patient with their pain because they can't tell you they're in pain if they have the cranial nerves being affected because they can't speak. So you'll wanna make sure that you're treating it appropriately and that they're getting the medication they need. In addition, a lot of patients, as this progresses up to the respiratory system, they have a severe case of this, they will need to be um, intubated or have a trach place so they can get respiratory assistance. In addition, that puts them at risk for infection associated being on like a ventilator. So watch that. Also, they're at risk for urinary tract infection if they're retaining urine. So monitoring your patient for that. Also blood clots. Why are they at risk for blood clots? Well, they're immobile, they're paralyzed, they can't move around. So that blood stays stagnant, they can have a blood clot. So they'll most likely be on anticoagulants and you'll need SCDs, making sure that you're monitoring them for deep vein thrombosis or a pulmonary embolism. They don't have signs and symptoms associated with that. They're also at risk for pressure ulcers, also called pressure injuries. And that's again related to the immobility. So turning them frequently, um, performing range of motion, making sure they're getting off those bony promises. They're also at risk for weight loss because of everything going on. So monitoring their weights daily, decrease in muscle tone that they can have. So physical therapy, you'll be working with them as well, preventing those contractures, um, trying to maintain muscle integrity as much. Because as a lot of patients, if they have a severe case of this, as they start to recover, a lot of patients after they get discharged from the hospital will have to go to a rehab facility to build back up their muscle strength because their muscle tone is gone. A lot of patients have to learn to walk all over again and just how to do those normal activities of daily living. Now let's quickly go over the treatment for Guillain-Barre syndrome. Some important things to remember about these treatments that I'm about to go over is that they're not a cure, they don't cure the syndrome, but they can help speed up recovery time. So decrease recovery and decrease those signs and symptoms. But the catch with these treatments, in order for them to really work, is that they have to be administered two weeks from the onset of symptoms or they don't really get a decrease in signs and symptoms. The first thing is immunoglobulin therapy. This is where IV immunoglobulin from a donor is given to the patient to stop the antibodies that are damaging the nerves. Another thing is plasma phoresis. This is where a machine will actually filter the blood to remove the antibodies from the patient's plasma that are attacking the myelin sheath. So again, remember that this needs to be administered within like two weeks of those onset of the symptoms for it to be most effective. Okay, so that wraps up this review over Guillain-Barre syndrome. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.